Hello and welcome to today's video lesson. My name is Mr. Callan, if we haven't already met, and welcome to the first of the video series for our biology units one and two, starting with the first topic, which is the cell membrane. So the learning goal for today's lesson is to describe the structure of the cell membrane, including protein channels, phospholipids, cholesterol, and glycoproteins based on the fluid mosaic phospholipid bilayer model. And secondly, to describe how the cell membrane maintains relatively stable internal conditions. And we're gonna talk about how things move inside and outside of the cell through the membrane. Uh, and key terms from today's lesson will be diffusion and osmosis and concentration gradient. A good idea is to pause the video at this point and write down even just a summarized version, keywords from today's learning goal in your books. You can pause the video here and do that. Okay, moving on. So the road ahead. We have biology over years 11 and 12 divided into units one and two and units three and four. And so our current year 12s have already studied unit three and four and so now you will be finishing on unit one cells and two maintaining the internal environment where we talk about homeostasis and infectious disease current year 11s you obviously start on unit one and two and will finish on biodiversity and uh, our genetics unit unit four what does it look like for us well the term ahead here's our overview you can also find it in your one note uh, we start straight into it chapter one of the nelson biology textbook looking at the cell membrane looking at the structure of the membrane as well as how things can passively move and we'll talk about all these terms that i'm dropping right now a um, couple of key things we have some mandatory pracs coming up we also have our first assessment piece the data test in week six uh year 11 so you have your camp week nine and uh, then we'll kick off the next assessment piece towards the end of the term. Okay, let's get into the content for this lesson. So from 1.1 of your textbook, it is on the structure of the cell membrane. So the first thing you will see on this um, visual in front of you right now is that there are a whole bunch of key terms. These are taken directly from your textbook. And it is a very good idea. In fact, I would really like you guys to start creating a glossary, whether that's in a page at the back of your book or as you just take lesson um, notes from each lesson to start writing key terms down, highlighting them, summarizing them, putting them in your own words, maybe even drawing pictures to help you remember uh, what each term is. I will also begin each video with the learning goals again displayed on this slide so it was to describe the structure of the membrane and to pull out a few key features qcaa tells us what we need to be able to do for each verb that they give us they're called cognitive verbs so to describe means to give an account of something to describe patterns or processes or characteristics of something so we're going to look at characteristics and features of the cell membrane. What makes the cell membrane the cell membrane? Let's get into it. So first up, here is a simplified little image of a cell. And we can look at this and see, well, there's an outside and there's an inside. So that thing that separates the two is called the cell membrane. And the overall function of the membrane in a simplified description is to regulate what goes into and what goes out of the cell. It separates the insides from the outsides. The musk ox, on a different note, is this hoofed mammal that lives in the Arctic regions. And I'm just gonna use it as a cool analogy, an introduction um, to talking about the structure of the cell membrane. The feature that I'm gonna liken them to is the phospholipids. So phospholipids are the main little part that makes up this entire membrane. The phospholipid, if we just look at one of them, has two parts. It's got a head and this we call polar because it has a charge. 
then also has these two little tails. They don't have a charge, so we call them nonpolar. What does this mean? Well, the head, it loves water. We call it hydrophilic. But the tails, they actually hate water, so we call it hydrophobic. Like They have a fear of it. Oil, you would know, which is similar in structure to a lipid, um, separates itself from water. If you've ever done the dishes and you've seen the oil come to the surface, um, it distinctly separates itself from it. So that's kind of what we get here. And when these two um, tails face inwards, they create this, this region, this barrier. And so if we go, if we go back to the musk ox, we can see that they've got these massive heads with these horns. And what happens is if there's a bunch of them all together and a predator shows up, they create this kind of ring where the heads face outwards. The heads love a fight. And then if there's a baby musk ox, they will point their tails, essentially creating this barrier. And that's kind of how phospholipids work. The heads face outwards. They love a fight. They face the water but the tails face inwards and create this region where there is no water. And that is what creates this kind of ring, this barrier that we call the membrane. So the heads face the water and the tails face away. And every single cell in our body, period, has a membrane. They regulate what comes in and what comes out. We use the fluid mosaic model to represent our understanding of the structure and function of the membrane. So if we just break that term down, fluid means that, well, it can freely move. So this membrane is actually constantly shifting and moving. And mosaic, if you've ever seen a mosaic painting or tile pattern, means that it's made up of lots of different parts. And here, in this representation of the membrane, we can see that, well, if we just look at the big picture, even though there's a lot going on here, there's the membrane made up of the double layer of phospholipids, a layer here and a layer here, with the tails creating this region where there's no water because the tails hate water. So we have the extracellular fluid, that means the outside of the cell, and then we have the cytoplasm, and that's the fluid that makes up the inside of the cell. So cytoplasm is all this jelly-like fluid inside of here and the extracellular fluid surrounds it. We can see um, what is the membrane mostly made up of? Well, phospholipids, they create this double layer, but we can also see these large blue features. Some are just on the inside surface, some go all the way through, some might be just on the outside surface, and these blue features are structures that we call proteins. So phospholipids and proteins are the two main features of a membrane. The function of the phospholipids, as we have said, um, separates the insides and the outsides of the cell. The function of the proteins allows particular things to come in and particular things to go out. We have different types of proteins that have different roles. For example, over here, we have a protein channel. And as the name suggests, it just provides a channel for certain things to pass through in and out. We also have cholesterol. Um, and cholesterol is the, these kind of features and they stabilize, they strengthen, and they help to maintain the fluidity of the membrane. We also have glycoproteins. And they are proteins on the, um, on the inside and the outsides. They basically have a sugar group that is attached to it. So here's like a little sugar. And they, they are important in cell to cell recognition. So in um, determining if what's next to them is another cell or not and how do they interact with each other. And that is basically an introduction and an overview to the structure of the cell membrane. And we've talked about protein channels, we mentioned phospholipids, cholesterol, and lastly, glycoprotein, cell-to-cell -cell recognition. And this, if this were an animation, 
we would be seeing this whole thing kind of moving and flowing. Um, and that is the fluid mosaic phospholipid by this two layers layer model. In 1.1 of your textbook for further readings, you can pause this video and write down any more key terms. But now I'm going to move on to that's the structure, the function of this membrane. How does it work? So this is from 1.2 of your textbook, and now we're looking at movement. So the learning goal is to describe how the membrane maintains a steady and a stable internal environment. And we'll look at diffusion and osmosis. And we've already said what describe it means. So let's get into it. The membrane is the structure that maintains stable internal conditions, but that doesn't always mean keeping the outsides out and the insides in. We actually want necessary nutrition, nu nutrients to come in and wastes to move out, such as carbon dioxide out, oxygen in. So things need to be able to pass through. And there are two ways in which material can pass through a cell. The first is called passive. The second is active transport. So basically, passive transport happens naturally. It happens by itself, and it does not require any energy. Whereas, as we'll look at more next week, active transport does require energy. Okay, so if we're talking about passive movement today, an analogy to help you think of this is, say, if you had a ball or an apple, and if you placed it on top of a hill, it would naturally roll down. You do not have to apply any external energy to that. It happens by itself. It moves from a high area to a low area. That's kind of how passive uh, movement works. Something goes from where there is a high concentration of it to a low concentration of it, just by itself. In the world of passive transport, there are two types. There is, as we have mentioned, diffusion, which also includes osmosis. I'll talk about that more soon. But there is also facilitated diffusion. And this is where proteins, like we just saw previously, are required to make that movement happen. So these types of movement require no energy as um, particles just flow down the concentration gradient. That is where there's lots of them to where there is not much of them until equilibrium is reached. And here again, you can see key terms down the side that you can take note of. So diffusion is the first type of passive movement. And an example of diffusion in our body is when oxygen passes from the alveoli these are the, the small sacs that uh, make up our lungs. Um, when oxygen passes out of our lungs into our bloodstream and the smallest blood vessels that surround the alveoli are called capillaries. So as we breathe oxygen in, we have a high concentration of oxygen in our lungs and a low concentration in our blood. So naturally, passively, the oxygen moves from our lungs into our blood system and that blood is then transported to the rest of our body so that all our cells can get um, a good supply of oxygen. So that's an example of diffusion, something moving from where this high to a low concentration. Another specific type of diffusion is called osmosis. And osmosis is the movement or diffusion of water across a membrane. It is the diffusion or movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And that's a good definition to jot down. If you look at this diagram here, you can see that there is a fluid that is also called, as you will read in your textbook, a solvent. And there are also these particles um, floating in that solution, that solvent. And those particles we refer to as solutes. And that can be salt, it can be sugar, just something that is um, floating around in there, dissolved in another substance. And in this diagram, you can see that there is a semi-permeable membrane. So there's a barrier that allows some things through, but not others. 
And in this classic diagram, we can see how there is a low concentration of solutes on one side of the membrane, but a high concentration on the other side. And so over time, osmosis occurs, that's the movement of water across the semi-permeable membrane, to reach equilibrium. That is the point where those particles are distributed evenly throughout the system. So because you would think, well, why didn't those particles just move over? Because of that membrane, say that sugar dissolved in water, maybe the sugar particles are too big to move across to, to reach equilibrium. So therefore, it is the water that moves and mysteriously rises over here until there is an equal concentration of sugar to water on both sides of the membrane. So that's what this diagram represents here. It's, it's a good idea to jot that down in your books as well um, and create uh, just put down some keynotes too. So where does this play out in our body? Well, it happens in our blood, in our red blood cells, the movement of water. And here we can see that there are red blood cells. Here's one. Are suspended in this solution. So in our blood, that would be plasma. And we're talking about water moving in and out. So when our red blood cells are in an isotonic solution, that means um, there is an equal concentration of, let's talk about the solids, salt in our red blood cells as there is to outside of our red, red blood cells. So water evenly passes in and it passes out of those cells. This is what we call an isotonic solution. What would happen though, if you injected salt into our blood? Think about that. Where is the higher concentration of salt now? Is it in the actual red blood cells or is it in the fluid that surrounds them, the plasma? Well, the saltiness would be in the plasma so to even out that salty concentration, which way is the water going to flow? If it is more salty outside of the red blood cells, the water will flow outside from the red blood cells into the plasma to try balance out that water to salt concentration. So water flows out in that case, and as a result, the red blood cells begin to shrivel. And when it is, when there's a high concentration of say salt outside of the cells, that's called a hypertonic solution. The other side of this is, well, what would happen if say there was a high concentration of solute salt inside the red blood cells? Which way is the water gonna flow to reach equilibrium? that water is going to flow in to try to dilute that saltiness. And as a result, the cells, as a result, the cells swell and they can even burst in a hypertonic solution. So there are the three types of solutions. And one way I remember it is hypo has an O in it. And when cells are in a hypotonic solution, what do they do? They swell, they become like this big O. So that's a cool little way to remember that. Okay. Osmosis, to recap, is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And what kind of membrane are we talking about in this case? Well, we're talking about um, the cell membrane as it allows some things through but not others. And that's how we maintain a stable and internal environment. The, the cell membrane surrounds all living things. So another example of diffusion, where we don't require energy, but we do require proteins to assist in this process, uh, is called facilitated diffusion. And you can see um, over here, here is a definition of it, and it just means a little bit of help is required for that movement to occur. And in, an example of this playing out is say glucose it's quite large compared to um, other smaller molecules such as oxygen and carbon dioxide which can can just pass through the, the membrane easily um, glucose 
actually requires a carrier protein, one that it can come into, that protein actually changes shape and it allows it to come into the cell. So that's what we call uh, facilitated diffusion. And an example of that is the glucose transport protein that we have in our body. We also have um, these proteins, which are just channels, which allow things to pass um, through as well. But they, they're not, maybe they've got a charge or maybe they're too big to just be able to pass through by themselves. The biggest thing that will determine whether a particle can pass through directly through the membrane, through di diffusion, is whether it has a charge or not. Um, size is also a factor in that regard. So that is passive movement. The learning goal was to describe how the cell membrane maintains stable conditions via passive movement, and we spoke about diffusion and osmosis. And next week, we're going to talk about well, what happens if we need to get something inside or outside of the cell against the concentration gradient. So that means we might want to get something where there is a, um, a low concentration of it to where there is a, a high concentration. We're going up the hill in that analogy. And I want you to think about why, where in the body would that be? a real thing where it, where it happens and we need it to happen. So bring your ideas to class and we'll talk about that um, next week. But that is all for today. And I will finish off with a few uh, things. The first being homework. So your homework this week is to read what we just spoke about in the textbook. That's chapters 1.1 and 1.2. As you do, Take notes, especially adding key terms to your glossary. Make it pretty, get a highlighter out, draw some pictures in to help you remember. Again, watch the short animation in the description of this video. It's only a minute and a half or so long, and it just puts into movement what we were talking about. Lastly, to create a model of the cell membrane. Get creative here. It might be virtual if you want to design something on your computer, physical if you like baking cakes or making models, or even just an annotated drawing showing the, the different features of the membrane and also their functions you can describe through annotation. I know that um, oh, that is due the last lesson of week two in class. So that's on Thursday or Friday, depending on your class. There's some extension students, and for you guys, this is out of the textbook. I would like you to read through these. Think about isotonic drinks. We advertise those in our marketing, and why are they such a big deal? What about venoms? How do they work in protein channels and um, causing dysfunction in our body? So you can pause the video here and look at that a little bit more. I'm moving on to show you a couple of animations just to recap what we spoke on. So there's two types of passive transport, right? The first is diffusion. That's where something just goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. And if they're small and uncharged, they can just pass straight through the membrane, such as oxygen coming in or carbon dioxide going out. Facilitated diffusion though is where we require some help and that's where proteins come into play. Again, it's passive going from a high to a low concentration. Um, and we spoke about the glucose, it's too big to just pass through. So it needs this protein channel to be able to um, pass through. But then we also have carrier proteins. And these are proteins that actually change shape to get that uh, material through. One more, we have osmosis, the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Three types of solutions, we have isotonic, evenly flows in and out, even concentrations, nice and happy. Uh, we also have hypotonic solutions. That's where water flows into the cell uh, because it's salty in here. And that causes it to swell and it can even cause it to burst. And then we have hypertonic solutions. This is where it's super salty outside. So the water is going to flow out and therefore the cell is going to shrivel. And I believe that, uh, believe that, yeah, that's it. And we just have a couple of memes to learn this in another way. So we can read that. Yeah, it's another one. 
So guys, I hope that this video has been informative and helpful. And if you have any questions, please come to me in class. In the meantime, I look forward to seeing you in class. So God bless you.